my Redeemer There is no more for heaven now to give He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace to this I hold, my hope is only Jesus For my life is wholly bound to His Oh, how strange and divine I can sing All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my Shepherd will be. into God's word this morning as we continue to worship. It's July the 5th, the day after the 4th of July or the uh, Independence Day. And so I want to ask us this question. 
What does freedom or liberty or independence mean to you? You see, I think it's pretty apparent that we have lost any real sense of the meaning of these words. In, I think, modern, our modern mindset in 2020, and especially in our behavior, freedom and liberty and independence means I can do whatever I want to do. And what we have found over and over and what we're seeing now is that when someone is wanting to do something and another person uh, is disagreeing with that or standing in their way, conflict and even violence erupts. And that's because we've lost the true sense of what freedom and liberty and even independence mean. And so I thought we should look at the last line of the Declaration of Independence. Have you ever read it? Have you ever heard it? It goes something like this. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. You see, in the Declaration of Independence, it wasn't just declaring the, U the colonies independent from the King of England. They were independent from England, but they were mutually pledging themselves to one another. That's what freedom and independence and liberty meant to those who drafted those founding documents. So I wonder, what do we do with our freedom? What do we do with our freedom? There was a historian and a social thinker who, uh, whose name is John, uh, Lord John Dahlberg Acton, and he said, famously said this, Liberty is not the power of doing what we like, but the right of being able to do what we ought. We're going to see today as we turn uh, to the book of Philippians and continue in our sermon series, Christ-like, we are going to find today what it means to be dependent on one another. It, we're going to find today what uh, it means for a Christian to live out their freedom because in following Jesus, we have a much higher bar uh, in, uh, in how we live with one another than even is written in the founding documents of the United States. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, for the freedom that we have gained through the grace, the saving grace of your Son, Jesus, we give you thanks. And no matter where we live on earth or what country we are citizens from, whether it's a free nation or one that is bound, we can find ultimate freedom in and through the sacrifice of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that your shed blood means we find true freedom and liberty that allows us to live above our circumstances. And yet we know that the way you call us and what you call us to do with that freedom uh, is difficult, uh, though it is beautiful. And so as we turn our hearts to your word, Lord, this morning, would you indeed free us from the things that enslave our hearts and our minds? Would you free us from the enslavement we have to our own desires? so that we can give our lives in love for the good of our neighbor, just as Jesus gave his life for us. When we pray these things in the name of Jesus, amen. So friends, turn with me as we continue in Philippians to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. We're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 5 today. Just as a quick background, remember, Paul is writing this letter likely from prison in Rome, 
around 61 AD. And he is probably facing execution from the Roman Emperor Nero. And even though he is bound and chained to a guard day and night, he's writing letters to encourage the churches uh, that he started. One of those churches is a small church in a city or a town called Philippi in the eastern part of what is now modern day Greece. And uh, it's a small church that is facing persecution by a rabidly Roman uh, culture around them. And so in this letter so far, we have seen that following Christ means laying down our lives and partnering with others to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. So turn with me this morning to Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. The word of the Lord. Now, these are a powerful, powerful five verses in the book of Philippians. It is a high bar, a high calling to how we are to treat others. As followers of Jesus, united in partnership in the gospel, to live and share the gospel, we have a much higher standard to live by. So let's take a look at the first two verses to see what that standard is. Again, Paul writes this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, if you have any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the Spirit and in one mind. What this means is that union with Jesus himself is our basis for loving one another. Without Christ, we can't do it. We would not have any motivation to do it. If you notice, all of what comes next is predicated. It begins, it's based on this. Uh, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. In fact, that's what we're seeing is the whole theme of the book of Philippians is that it centers our life, our death, and our future life all centers on who Jesus is, what Jesus has done for us, and in becoming like Jesus Christ himself. It's in becoming Christ-like. And so, Paul appeals to them saying, if you are indeed, if you have any union with Jesus, if you have any belief, if you have any life in Christ, if you have given yourselves to, have entrusted yourselves to Jesus, then that is the basis for loving one another. You and I can't do it on our own. Just wanting to be good people, just not stealing and cheating on your taxes or not killing someone isn't enough. The shape of our lives, how we treat other people, begins in our union with Jesus. So if you struggle with loving others, maybe it's someone in your own household or a neighbor or a coworker. If you struggle with loving others, of like being united to someone, 
and a common way of life. It's not just because you're a bad person or that you're sinful. It's all of us. It's because we lack union with Christ. The cause of our lack of love for one another is that we are not living in union with Jesus. That's really what the first verse of uh, chapter 2 is telling us. So I wonder, how are your relationships at home with your spouse or your children or whoever is living in your household uh, or in your wider family? How about at church? How about in the workplace or with your real neighbors in your neighborhood, wherever you live? What are your relationships like? Let's continue uh, with verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Let's start with this verse 3 now. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Now, for you and I, if we have put our trust and faith in Jesus, if we are Christians or disciples, or better, a better way to put it is Christ's followers, then we have to die to ourselves. There's a realistic expectation that we put to death our desires for self-preservation, for self-promotion, and for self-indulgence. Let's think about that again. For Christ followers who die to themselves, there is a realistic expectation. That means it's going to happen. It should be happening. That we put to death our own desires for self-preservation, self-promotion, and self in indulgence. Wow, that is a high bar, but that is really what it means to, uh, in humility, value others above yourselves. I wonder how many times we say in our life, it's either me or this person. If I don't do this, then I'm not going to get what I want out of life, even if it means someone else losing or hurting someone. Really, that's fundamentally what happens many times in a divorce. We finally say, it's either me or the other person, and I have to choose myself. Now, for some, for some people, it's just a broken reality without judgment, but it shows that how deep our self-preservation goes and how destructive it is that we often cannot choose to put others ahead of ourselves. Or this idea that someone is going to threaten our livelihood, maybe our job security or something that we want, and it's owed to us first, and so I can defend it by any means necessary because by rights, it's mine. That's what we mean by self-preservation. How about this idea of self-promotion? in a world that is bombarded by social media that looks to be that looks to become the center of attention look at me look at my life look what i look like or what i've achieved in my life i want to get ahead so i need to put myself out there ahead of others this idea of valuing others more than myself is a very difficult one i wonder how are the uh, subtle and not so subtle ways that we promote ourselves. In our own families or in our own daily life, I wonder how often we seek to build other people up. When we've done something or achieved or accomplished something, how often do we take a step back and recognize others that have helped us do those things? Maybe it's a spouse or children or family members. Maybe it's a coworker in the background or an assistant of some sort. Maybe it's a team that we work with. Certainly, as we're thinking about 
uh, American independence these days and thinking about our freedoms, how about all of the people who have sacrificed not only in giving their lives in service of our country, but have sacrificed day in and day out and long, uh, tedious hours and dead-end jobs so that we can have the fruits of their labor. And we don't think about them at all. I wonder how much we recognize the efforts and the contributions of others, or do we want to outshine other people? How about self-indulgence? This, of course, uh, in some ways looks at, of course, just consuming more stuff than we need. But in another way, it's also saying, I'm going to take what I need to soothe or to calm myself. When I am suffering, then anything that will help me feel better, I have a right to. It can, uh, it's really subtle, it can sneak in there with phrases like, it's wine o'clock, or uh, I'm just going to dive into Netflix binging. I'm not going to look and see what others may need. I am just going to indulge my own wants and needs and desires. For Christ followers who die to themselves, there is a realistic expectation that doesn't mean it's just some nice idea. It means you should actively be putting to death your desire. I should be putting to death my desire for self-preservation, for self-promotion, and for self-indulgence. That indeed is a high bar. Let's go on to verse 4. Now, looking to your own, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. If we're not going to be looking to ourselves, then we need to be looking after the interests of others, Paul says. Now, this just doesn't imply being nice or polite or even empathetic. It means actively pursuing and promoting the well-being of others even at your own expense. Any of you who are parents know this is true. In order to serve your children, to do it well, it costs you. It costs you sleep. It costs you time and energy. It costs you emotional strength and headspace. It costs to seek the well-being of someone else. It always does. What Paul is calling us here to is not some kind of passive, nice personism. We're located in West Michigan, and sometimes it's referred to as West Michigan nice. We don't just want to play well with others and not rock the boat or upset someone's, someone else's apple cart. We actively pursue and promote the well-being of others. And I'm not going to preach to you a political sermon, but I wonder in this day and age when we're pitted one against another, Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter, protesters versus police, the right versus the left, Americans versus immigrants, whatever the opposing side is, I wonder what it means to lay all of that down and to pursue and promote the well-being of others, even at our own expense. That is what Paul means when he says, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Now, I wonder, does that seem extreme to us? Well, it should. It should seem extreme because we are called to become Christ-like. Jesus' love for us was extreme. Paul goes on to say this in the fifth verse. In your relationships with one another, he's summing all of this up, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, as Christ Jesus. 
Nowhere does Paul in, uh, in this book of Philippians leave room for something that we call in the church easy believeism. Easy believeism. That means I believe in Jesus Christ and go to heaven when I die. Of course, that is true, but that is an incomplete gospel. The whole gospel, the whole good news about Jesus is that it requires us to love others in such a way that they experience the extravagant love of God through us and so are drawn to Jesus. Which means, inevitably, that we have to die to ourselves just as Jesus died and gave up his life for us. Now, you might say those are all high, great, wonderful thoughts. But I'm a practical person. You know, what, what do you mean? What's this really mean for my life? I just need to be a little nicer. I need to go out of my way to help somebody. Well, I thought as I was praying about this, that there is one challenging thing and it's becoming rarer and rarer day by day, especially in our modern American culture. Yet it's something that throughout scripture that we are called to do profoundly. One of the best ways that we have to begin loving one another, to begin preferring one another, thinking of someone as more important than ourselves, to look to their own interests above our own, is to ask someone for forgiveness whom we have wronged in some way. Asking for forgiveness. Who do you need to seek forgiveness from? Maybe it's a spouse or one of your children, a parent maybe, a friend, maybe an estranged friend. How about a coworker, a neighbor, a fellow Christian, an extended family member that you've fallen out with? Who do you need to seek forgiveness from? Do you see in those moments right there in that pause that I left, how many of us began to say, yes, but they did X, Y, or Z. Or they haven't yet asked forgiveness for me. Or they don't even know what they did wrong. How can I? This is one of the proving grounds for valuing someone more than you value yourself and putting their interests above your own. It's by asking for forgiveness regardless of what the other person is like. It costs us. Even Jesus himself did it. When he was on the cross, when he was on the cross, he was dying and he was dying for the sin of the whole world and yet the crowds were cheering crucify him. They were jeering at him. They were taunting him, saying, if you were really God, then prove it and come down off of that cross. And the moment when he was giving up his life for, his, for our sins and we were rejecting him, he prayed to his father, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was the pinnacle of humility and self-sacrifice to ask for the forgiveness of those around him, even though he had done nothing wrong. In fact, there was another Christian, his name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He led an underground church in Nazi Germany. Uh, and he was persecuted for years and finally he was arrested along with several others uh, even though there was an official German church that was aligned with the Nazis there was a, a underground church that said you cannot worship Jesus and follow Hitler. Eventually toward the end of the war they were uh, Bonhoeffer and some others were rounded up and sent to concentration camps where ultimately he was stripped bare and hung uh, for his belief and his resistance to the Nazi regime. Dietrich Bonhoeffer 
knew what it meant to struggle for community, to put the good of someone else above his own good, even to risk his life. And he wrote this. In confession, and what follows after confession, which is seeking forgiveness, in confession occurs the breakthrough of the cross. The root of all sin, he says, is pride. I want to be my own law. I have a right to myself, my hatred and my desires, my life and my death. My mind and the mind and flesh of man are set on fire by pride, he says. For it's precisely in his wickedness that man or humans want to be God or to be like God. Confession is the present, confession in the presence of a brother is the profoundest kind of humiliation, which means before God, we experience the cross of Jesus as our rescue and our salvation. The old man dies, but it is God who has conquered him. Now we share in the resurrection of Jesus and eternal life. That is very powerful and some very deep sentiments from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. What it really says is to confess publicly, openly, to say to someone, I have done something wrong, and then to ask for forgiveness is a humbling, a profoundly humbling thing, one that requires us to die to ourselves. But really what happens is that we gain the opportunity for Jesus Christ to resurrect us and then we receive eternal life. The good news is this. It doesn't mean that this way of living, preferring others, looking to the needs of others before our own interests, to prefer others and to think of them as more important than ourselves. It doesn't mean a life of misery. No, instead we are entrusting our well-being in every way to Jesus, who has already proven his love and his grace and his generosity towards us, and we know that it knows no bounds. When we prefer others, when we are dedicated to the well-being of someone else, when we recognize because of Jesus they are more important than I am, then we are entrusting our own well-being to Jesus and he is wonderful at making sure we have what we need. Ultimately, it's everything that comes with the new life he gained for us on the cross. So friends, that really is what Paul is calling us to live, how Paul is calling us to live in Christ-likeness. In your relationships with one another, he ends, have the same mindset as Jesus. So let's take the opportunity this week to think through who we have wronged and ask the Holy Spirit for the courage and the humility that it is, that's required to die to ourselves and out loud to confess what we've done wrong to them and ask for forgiveness. If you ask the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will prompt you who it is that you need to go to. It could be someone as close as your spouse or someone in your household, or it might be someone that you've been estranged from for, for a long time. If you feel fear, or anxiety, or even anger and frustration. Pray about it. Ask the Holy Spirit to allow you to lay that down. And ask Jesus for the courage to be able to ask for forgiveness from that person. If we all live that kind of life, we will become people who more and more look to the interests of others knowing that they are more important than we are. And in so doing, they're going to experience the love of Jesus 
and they are going to want to receive that love for themselves. And we, in turn, are going to discover new life, resurrection life, a freedom, an independence, a kind of liberty that we have never known because now we have laid down our life and nothing can threaten us, as we talked about last week, because Christ himself has become our life. Friends, this is good news. And for Christians living in the United States in 2020, this is the difficult way that Jesus is calling us to be Christ-like. Now, there are lots of different ways that people have been calling us to uh, live into the difficult conversations that are happening in our culture. But one very practical way that you probably aren't, won't hear on the news or see on social media is to go and ask for forgiveness for someone you have wronged. In that way lies, lies Christ-likeness. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you ultimately paid the price. You did not look to your own interests, but put our interests, saving us from eternal suffering and separation from you, and you reuniting us with the Father, with one another and all creation. You put that ahead of your own good. Even though you were perfect, you yourself were God, and you came down and suffered for us. You made us more important than yourself. That is such a high bar. And yet, Lord, amazingly, not only do you call us to do the same, you, through the power of the Spirit, are asking us to do the same thing. This week, would you help us take the steps that we need to put others ahead of ourselves? Lord, if there's someone that we need to reconcile with, for whom we need to ask, from whom we need to ask forgiveness, give us the courage to go and confess that to them. In that, Lord, I pray that every one of us this week would begin to receive new life, resurrection power, so that we can become more like you and that others might receive saving love, the gospel that you have given us to share with those around us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I hope this challenge of Paul's is good news to you. So go in the peace of Christ knowing that he holds nothing back for your own good. before the Lamb of God and sing you are worthy of it all you are worthy of it all for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory the glory.